you know, when we come together and just get into the Word, I have the privilege of sharing kind of what I'm learning, uh, but I, I love like when we get in our small groups and everybody just shares what they're learning uh, because there's such a joy as we learn stuff from God because God is alive and He constantly is speaking into our lives if we tune our ears in to hear Him. And, and it's when, when He speaks to us, when we begin, it, it's, it's never just for ourselves. But everything that, every time that God impacts our lives and begins to change our lives and bless our lives, it's really for the purpose of then also sharing it with others. And so I love that I get a chance on Sundays to get up and share with you the things that God is, is talking to me about. Uh, and so we're doing this series called This Is Us. And it's basically just about who we are as a church, just some of the key um, uh, values, uh, the key characteristics of, of the culture that we want to build as a church. And so it's a short little three-part series that we did. Bertina kicked it off a couple of weeks ago, just talking about the, the, the compassion of Christ. And I love that song, Christ Be Magnified, because really that's the foundation of all that we do as a church. It's really all about Jesus, what he's done and his presence in our lives. And it's his love, it's his compassion that moves our hearts uh, to share love with others. It's not our ability to love, but it's how much he loves us. And when we begin to understand how much He loves us and experience that love, then it's really easy actually to begin to love others and to share that love with, with others. And so it's a great word on just how we center our lives. And as a church, we center around the compassion, the love of, of Christ. And, and I love the word compassion because it's, um, it's, it, it, it has this, these two uh, parts to it. Calm is a, the with people. Because loving, you, you can't just sit in your room and think about oh, how much I love people. At some point, it has to actually come into our relationships where love has to be walked out. It has to be spoken out. And, and passion has to do with really that, that sense of desire, emotion that we have and that, that sharing. When there's a passion, it begins to, to, to flood over into our actions and into our relationships. And it's a passion for people. It's really a coming alongside and it's sensing what's going on in their lives. And then it's our heart sharing uh, the love of God to, to pour into where other people are walking in their lives. And so that's that, that Christ-centered compassion. And then last week we've talked about hunger and how important it is, desire, the desires that we have. Because really it's desires that move us. And the question is, what are we desiring? Because it's not just a matter of doing whatever we want. But really where freedom comes is when we begin to desire and do the things that we should be wanting and desiring. Because just doing whatever we want leads our lives into destruction and dissipation. But as we begin to shape the appetites of our, our hearts and shape our desires to be the things that will bring um, benefit into our lives and will begin to align our lives for the purposes for which we created, that's when our lives begin to be transformed in powerful ways and we begin to make a difference and we begin to experience the kind of peace and satisfaction and hope that we were created for as long as our lives are not aligned and we're desiring things that are contrary to the way we were created and what we we're created for then there will always be some irritation in our lives there always be that sense of some lack in our lives there always be that sense of things don't fit there always be going to be this longing desire for more that's not supposed to be fulfilled and so that's desire hunger understanding we want to be a church that's hungry we want to be a church that has a desire but we want to be a church that desires and has an appetite for the right things the things that are going to significantly change our lives and the community around us and then the last thing today we're going to talk today is is about um discipleship discipline discipleship and discipline in our lives uh and so today was as we um open up the scriptures uh, and read our our theme verse for today is from Matthew chapter 7 verses 24 through 27 it says everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house but it did not fail because it had been founded on the rock and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand and when the rains fell and the floods came, the winds blew and beat against the house, it fell and great was the fall of it. See, we're all building a life. Whether you are building with intentionality 
or just kind of letting life come to you and just kind of building however. Uh, some of us, our houses, uh, when we're built with intentionality, uh, houses can be beautiful. Uh, but others, uh, our houses are kind of like, you know, whatever the, whatever the stream brings along and whatever gets caught, you know, in the, in the, uh, uh, along the side of the stream. And just uh, leaves and, and rocks and, and uh, leaves and trees and twigs and whatever junk piles up on the side. And our houses become kind of like that because that's how we live our lives. Just whatever life brings, just is what, that's what we're going to build our life on. And there's no intentionality, there's no plan. And so our lives, we wonder why our lives just don't seem to work. It's because we're just, we're, we, we have no plan. We're not building a house on the rock. We're just building it according to the whims and the circumstances that come our way. And, the, and, and, and Jesus is saying, build your house on the rock, on a solid foundation. That takes more work. It takes more time. But that's a house that's going to stand when storms come. And here's one guarantee. Storms will come into your life. Whether they're caused by you or caused by circumstances or caused by others, storms are going to hit your life. That's something you can, you know, uh, you can build your life upon. <laughs> or you can expect, that's an expectation that will be fulfilled, is that your life and mine, every single one of us, will have storms that hit our lives. The storms might be just emotional. They might be physical. They might be relational. They might be financial. But storms will hit every single one of our lives and in those times of storm that's when we find out how strong the foundation upon which we built our life really is and so as as a church we want to make sure that we're not just building big a big house that we're not just making you feel good about your house by just encouraging you and saying oh it's so great but we want to make sure that your house actually is built on the rock and the scripture here says, this is what a house built on the rock looks like. It's, it's people who read the scriptures, they read the words of God, they, they read the instructions that God gives us, they hear what God is saying, and they do it. There's a lot, there's huge chunks of my life that I've lived where I've studied the word and I love the Bible, and, but I... And, and I, I love like theology and understanding things. I, I have a little bit of a scientific bent, so I, I love knowing the why behind things and how things work. Um, but for a lot of my life, I've just been, I've just loved the studying part, but been very poor at the application part, the actual doing of the things that I'm studying. And so then we wonder why when things go bad and someone criticizes us or something doesn't work out in life, we get frustrated with God, we get frustrated with life. And we just want to throw the towel in. It's because we've not been people who actually build our lives on doing what the Bible says. We just have known the Bible. We, you know, we love to talk about how, you know, as churches, we can, we sing songs about the Bible. We listen to lectures about the Bible. We have small group studies about the Bible. You can read books and blogs and podcasts about the Bible. Um, and yet not actually live the Bible. I don't know about you, but, you know, uh, I, I know... Um, it, my, my family had six kids, right? And my mom, to, to, to control six kids, there were strict rules. Like, otherwise, you're in a madhouse. You got five boys running around without any rules. It's just going to be a madhouse, right? So she had strict rules. She had a chart, like, okay, this is what you do every day. Everybody had, had uh, their chores that they had to do every day. Someone had to throw out the rubbish. Someone had to, you know, set the table. Someone had to clean the room. Someone had to do, everybody, we, you know, we had our homework time. Everything was very strict. Every, dinner time, everybody sits at the table. We we're very ordered and structured. And it wasn't a matter, you know, it, it, none of us ever came to mom and said, mom, you're going to love this. I wrote a song about our chore list. And I, I got to go to my friends at school and like we studied the chore list, so cool, you know. And, and then I made a t-shirt with like the, the chore list on my t-shirt. And my mom's going to say, but, but did you do your homework? No, but man, I, I got this cool, I memorized about it, you know, and, I got, and we studied about it and we made a song about doing the chores. Mom's going to say, uh, you actually got to do the chores, you know. Um, but as Christians, that we, that's, that's kind of what we do so often. God says, you know, love one another, read the Bible, follow Jesus, obey him. And we know all that. And we got plaques and posters and books and podcasts. But what God wants is to be wise people who actually build our lives on the rock, which means we do what we hear. And so today's going to be kind of one of those messages where we're just talking a lot about this is what we do. 
uh, it may not be as inspiring. It may not be as entertaining. Um, but I, I want you to not be fools. Like the Bible says, we don't want to be fools who hear the word and don't do it. And just think that was so many great stories. And I, I love that illustration. And it was so funny, that anecdote. But we want to say, this is what we do. This is us. This is what it means for us. As, as a church, discipleship is really the main thing that we do. But, but what does that mean? We just say we, we build our lives on discipleship. What does it mean? And so today we're going to look at discipleship. So definition of discipleship. Then we're going to talk about the process of discipleship. Then we're going to talk about discipline. Because discipline is such a key aspect of discipleship. And then we're going to take up communion uh, at the end. Uh, and so discipleship. We're going to break down discipleship. Now I got saved when I was seven years old. This is back in 1967. Um, this was back in, 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 in Hawaii, in, the, in, the, in America. And it was kind of what we call the, the Jesus movement, which was this a huge a time when many, many people were getting saved and coming to Jesus. And society was changing. Christianity was ha having an impact in the 60s and 70s. Uh, and so I got saved into this church. I was only seven years old. When I came to this little church, uh, I got saved in Sunday school class. So I love Sunday school. Um, and, and we talked about discipleship, but I had no clue what that was, uh, what discipleship was. It actually wasn't until I hit uh, high school and then that, that we started, I started going to these Bible studies in my high school. And guys would talk about this thing called discipleship. I remember this book by a guy named Winky Pratney, Doorways to Discipleship. And so we started studying all these, these things about discipleship and what it meant. To, and, and back then, our, our, our definition of discipleship was basically following Jesus. It means to, to follow Jesus. And that's the primary thing. But, 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 okay, but following Jesus... What, what does that mean to me? I'm a follower of Jesus. What does that look like? Back in, in, the, in the day, in the 70s, uh, we had these, um, these sandals made out of buffalo hide. And, and they, we, we call them Jesus walkers because we imagine they look like what Jesus wore back when he walked the earth. So we, everybody had to get a Jesus walker, you know, had some Jesus walkers so that we were cool and we're sure that we're following Jesus. And we want to be like the Jesus freaks, they used to call them. Jesus freaks means we'd come to, to school in high school, we'd carry big Bibles and bring a guitar and sing Jesus songs. And we were like Jesus freaks, you know. Uh, and so that was discipleship. Uh, it wasn't until college that I actually had to figure out what discipleship was because I remember um, when I was a, a junior in, 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 in college, um, the, the college pastor came and said, hey, um, I'm going to turn the college ministry over to you. Uh, I got to go help with the church. And uh, so I can't lead the college ministry anymore. And so I'm like, I'm a student. I'm going to take over the college ministry. And, and, and so he says, so what we're going to do is we're going to make disciples and we're going to do it with small groups. And I'm like, ah, I don't know what that even means. You know, I don't even know how to do that. So what I did was I bought books. I went out and looked for books on small groups. How do you do small group Bible studies? And what is discipleship? And I found books by a group called Navigators and some other books on discipleship. And I just started reading. And, and I had a team of 12 leaders in, in our, our college ministry. And so I said, okay, we're going to make disciples we're going to do it through small groups, just like Jesus. Jesus had his 12. We got our 12. We're going to do it, you know. I don't know what that actually means. I've never done it myself. But I got a book, you know. So, so I just started saying, here's what the book says to do. You just do this, you know. So we just started doing what the book said. Um, and I remember, you know, I, I was training them all how to do small groups. I didn't even lead a small group. But I was training them because the I was teaching them what to do with the books. And the group was growing and, and more people were getting saved and people were coming to Christ. And, and, uh, and then there were too many. Uh, like all our groups were, were too full. They're like, we can't take anybody else. You know, we got, all, we got too many in our group. So, and so finally, Bruce, you got to start one. I'm like, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> you know, so I had to do what I'd been reading and teaching. Uh, and, and so then that's actually how I learned about discipleship. And so we're just going to kind of walk you through so that you're not like me wondering, well, what does discipleship mean? And Because a lot of us, we're Christians all our lives, and we think Christianity, we, we, we have certain concepts of discipleship. But as a church, if discipleship is going to be our main thing, then we want to all have the same understanding. What does the Bible say that discipleship is? Because if that's the main thing that we do as a church, then we should all be doing it together. And then we should all have the same understanding of what it means. So you're okay with this? Are we ready to embark on a teaching on discipleship and discipline? Discipline is not what we like. But uh, let's, let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we are, are so thankful that you call us to follow you. And you've called us to be your disciples. 
you've called us, Lord, to be a disciple-making church. And disciple-making people. And Father, today as we, we look into your word and we, we unpack the different thoughts there and the different practices, Lord, we're praying that your Holy Spirit would speak to each and every one of us, that you'd show us that, Father, wouldn't be just a religious practice that we do, wouldn't just be doing something because the church is doing it, but, but we'd be doing it because your Spirit is speaking to our hearts. And that, Lord, as we do disciples, we, discipleship, we wouldn't be uh, disciples of uh, people, we wouldn't be disciples of a church, but truly we would be followers of you and your disciples. So we invite you to come, speak to us today, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. You know, we do serve a God who speaks. Jesus, God has a mouth, he has ears and he hears us, he has a mouth and he speaks to us. But for a lot of us, it's just learning how to hear his voice and being comfortable with sharing our hearts with him. And in the end, that's actually what Christianity is. It's, it's a relationship with God. It's not just a, a system of rituals and beliefs that we all agree to, but it's really a relationship that we have with the living God. And so my encouragement to you, if that's something that sounds strange or something that's not how you've defined Christianity, I'd encourage you to just begin to ask God and say, God, you speak to me. If you're really there and you really do speak and, and, and your promise is true that your sheep hear your voice, then you help me to hear your voice. Because we can't make you hear God, but we have a God who speaks himself. And as you open your heart, you'll begin to experience the voice of God in your life and nothing will be the same. So discipleship, here we go. Let's get on. This definition of discipleship, Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. Jesus called out to them, come follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. So this verse, this is Jesus defining discipleship. Come follow me. And that's where it begins. It begins with following. Following Jesus means having a relationship with him. It's not like we follow someone on Instagram. It's not, we're not just becoming fans of Jesus. We're not just learning about Jesus, although that's an important part of following Jesus, but it really, we learn about him so that we can have a relationship with him. So I remember when I started just liking my wife, you know, and I started going on Facebook and gathering all the photos I could find of her, like I was her stalker, you know, just basically stalking the woman. Um, and, and, uh, and it's okay to stop Jesus. In fact, he invites us into that relationship. Uh, and praise God that, uh, that she liked me too, because that would have been really awkward <laughs> otherwise. Um, but, but, but gathering information about Jesus is a part of pursuing him so that we grow in relationship with him. But in the end, it's the relationship that counts. I don't want to be just one of those guys who's a fan of my wife. I want to be her husband. And when Jesus invites us into a relationship with him, Christianity is not a bunch of fans of Jesus. It's actually, Jesus says, the church is actually my bride. And bride is like you live with, you have relationship with, you fight with. And I, I fight with Jesus sometimes. I don't always like what he tells me to do. I don't always do what he tells me to do. <laughs> a lot of times I just ignore him. But I'm in a relationship with him. And God invites us into relationship with him that's what it is follow relationship with jesus that is what christianity is really all about is this relationship with god and i can look back over my life the many different times that god has spoken into my life and guided me along the way and i can look back the many different times in my life when i've just not so much liked jesus and ignored jesus disagreed with him but we have this relationship and I've, in my life, I've committed myself, just like I've committed my, myself to my wife. We still have fights. Sometimes we disagree, sometimes I just ignore her. You know? But I, I'm committed to her. I love her. She is number one in my life and will always be the main thing in my life outside of my relationship with God. And it's the same with God. We commit ourselves to say, God, till death do us part. And the, the great thing about it is God is when we die, we actually get closer to him, which is, you know, it's, it's a forever relationship. So follow. 
Jesus invites us, come follow me. And this fellowship, Jesus called the disciples as a group of people. He, he said to them, if you go back to that scripture, uh, Jesus called out to them. And then Jesus is always known as Jesus and his 12. Why? Because when God calls us, he calls us in relationship. And so fellowship is the second part of discipleship. So if you're not following Jesus, if you're not pursuing him, and if you're not in fellowship, then you're actually miss missing discipleship as Jesus defines it. Now, most churches, we define discipleship as find a bunch of people who know Jesus and, and, and who are followers of Jesus and try to make them better followers of Jesus. And for, for most of my life, that's how I define discipleship. And I'd say, well, there's the people who don't know Jesus and the people who do know Jesus, the people who identify as Christians. And discipleship means find some people who identify as Christians and try to help them be better Christians. But that's not how Jesus defined it. He said, if you follow me, what's going to happen to you is you're going to have fellowship, yes, with other Christians. You can't be a disciple without that. But you're also going to fish. What I'm going to, where you're going to end up is you're going to be a fisher for men. What does that mean? He's saying those who are outside the body of Christ, who don't know quite yet, know what it means to be a Christian, don't have yet have a relationship with Christ. We're to bring those people into a relationship with Christ. And if Jesus is the most important relationship in our life, then that's just a natural, that's just a natural result of living a life of following Jesus is that we want to bring others into following Christ. And so that's a simple definition, to follow, fellowship, and fish. Um, the three Fs of what it means to be a disciple. As a church, that's, what we that's how we will define discipleship. And we look at our lives and say, am I, am I fishing for other people? Am I fellowshipping? Am I in fellowship with, with other, other believers? And am I following Jesus? So now what's the process of discipleship? In other words, those sound good. I want to be a fisher of men. But it's not like I, you know, I, 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 my grandfather's a fisherman. And my brothers and I, we had friends who were fishermen. And they taught us how to fish. And they'd take us out at night to, you know, to, to go uh, diving and, and go spearfish. And they'd teach us how to sit, lay, lay nets to catch fish. And they'd take us out on boats to go out of deep sea fishing and bottom fishing and all these different kinds of fishing that we learned. But how do, you, how do we learn how to, to, to fish uh, in discipleship, fish for men? And what does it look like to, to, to grow in fellowship with each other? Because we're human. And if you're in church long enough, and if you dig into, if you start to build relationships long enough, you're going to find that other people are sinners just like you. And sometimes our sin clashes with other Christians. And sometimes, you know, we don't, we, we get into conflict with people. And so what's the process of overcoming that and, and growing in our relationships and following God? And so this is the process of discipleship, the simple steps that we take. This is how we grow as disciples. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, go, therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So, as we're making disciples, and as we're teaching. So these are the two things he says. He says well, first he says, go. So it's something that you and I, discipleship is not something that comes to us. And it's not something that just happens to us. Jesus says, actually, you have to go. You have to go get up and do things differently. Go means a change, change of location. And it might be a change of location in our hearts. It might actually be a physical change of location. But the Bible says we have to go. So part of the process of discipleship is going. And as you're sitting here today, as, as we're talking about this, you just ask God, God, who am I supposed to go to? Because I guarantee you there are people already within your circle of life that God wants you to go to, people that he's already sending you to and saying the reason why you're part of, you're in that class, the reason why I put you in that family, the reason why you're in this neighborhood, the reason why you're in that company or this organization, the reason why you hang out with these friends is because there are people there that I want to send you to. And go starts with just obeying God and saying, okay, I'm going to go to them. And then it says, and then make disciples. And make disciples is an active 
engagement. We, when you make something, it takes effort. It takes a plan to go build something. It's like we love to buy IKEA furniture. You know, and some people, when they buy Ikea and the furniture, they just like to open up the boxes and just try to start putting stuff together. And invariably, you throw everything together and you find pieces still there, like, that belongs somewhere. And then the door doesn't open so well or it doesn't stand up straight. And you realize, oh, that piece is important. But what you could do is get that piece, open it up, look for what they call the instructions. And you look at the instructions and they usually have like a well, number one, number two, and then you follow the instructions and do number one and do number two and do number three and do number four. And they try their best to make it dummy proof so that people like me can actually put stuff together, you know. And God tries to do the same. He gives us instructions to say, here's how you make disciples because making disciples is an active engagement. It's not something that just happens because we've hung out long enough. But there's a plan and there's intentionality make disciples of all the nations i love that we're every nation and i love that we look around the room and there's a lot of nations because that's part of what god wants us to do every nation in other words there's no room for prejudice there's no room for division everybody's welcome you baptize them i love we did the baptize baptism last uh, last sunday so much fun uh, baptizing Philip and Sophie and Hannah, you know, the whole family. That's special. I love being be able to baptize whole families together. I, I love the individuals too. But there's something special about families being able to be baptized together. It was so cool. Uh, and it's just a, such a celebration of people saying, yeah, I want to be a part of the, the family. I want to be part of the body. Be baptized them. And then it says, teach these new disciples. So, so we have an obligation to know stuff in order to teach stuff. So if you want to be a disciple and you want to be a part of making disciples, you actually have to be involved, actively involved in teaching, passing on what you know. You don't have to be an expert. You just have to pass on everything that you know. We, we always say you just got to be one day ahead. If you've been a Christian for one day, you have one day's worth of Christian information that you can pass on to somebody else. You know, so just, you just take what you know and pass it on. So we don't have to be a room of experts and you know it's not about the guy who stands on stage and lectures all day it's about each and every one of us taking what we've learned putting it into practice so that we are wise people not foolish people put it into practice and then share with other people this is what happened when i put it into practice and sometimes that's awesome you're saying man these great things happen I, I, you know i i thought maybe god wanted me to talk to someone and i went and talked to them and turned out they were such, in such a, a hard, broken place, and I was able to, to, to comfort them and pray with them, and they were crying, and God met them. So awesome. And, and other times it's like, well, I read the Bible today, and it didn't make any sense to me at all. And that's my story for today. You know, so and it's okay, because our lives go like this, like any relationship. But it's just walking with God day to day and sharing what the reality of what's happening in our lives. We don't have to live a false life. We don't have to put up a pretense of what we think Christians should look like. We just have to walk in relationship and share that journey with others. Because sometimes someone else in the area where you're struggling, they'll be able to say, you know what, I had that same struggle and here's what I did. Or, you know, you're talking about that area of, of difficulty in your life. And, and this is something God spoke to me just today. And let me share with you what God said. And, and it's so fun when we start to see God working through our relationships. So teach these new disciples to obey. Again, it's active. It's not just teaching them to know. It's not just giving out information, but teaching them to obey. Which, which means that we, we get into a place where we exchange life. Where we share life together. That's part of why we have small groups is, is, is here on a Sunday, you can just come listen to a lecture or get entertained and go home. But in small groups is where we actually, we, we, there's dialogue and there's, inter, in, in, there's an exchange of, of life and saying, here's what's going on in my life. Here's what I did. And what do you think about what the Bible says? And what are you going to do about it? And then the next week, come back together again and saying, so how'd it go? And you're like, ah, I didn't do anything, you know. Oh, I did it and it was great. Or I did it and nothing happened. Well, stay with it. So this is what we do. We, we teach people to obey and be sure in all of that, that God is with you because God is, ne he says he's never going to leave you, never going to forsake you, but also just by definition, theologically, we understand that, that God is everywhere. He's what we call uh, omnipresent. And so yes, God will always be with you because he can't not be with you. 
This is who he is. This is nature. The essence of God is that he's omnipresent. Our, our part is, is being aware of him and making ourselves aware of him and engaging with him in our lives. And that's when, when God says, when Jesus says, remember that I'm always with you, it's really encouraging us to stay conscious of his presence in our lives, aware of him. Just like I, I need to be aware of my wife and not live like I'm still single. I need to be aware when she's in the house. I need to be aware when we're walking out together um, and on the streets together. There's an awareness of them being there. And, and we have to, ha to develop this awareness of God because most of us have been living uh, lives separate from God and not aware of his presence in our lives. And so just developing that habit of being aware of his presence that's the process of discipleship. We, we call this process the four E's. I don't know if you can read that. The yellow one doesn't show up so well. But four E's. Engage, establish, equip, empower. I'm not sure how this is going to translate for our Chinese congregation. We'll have to figure that out. The four E's. Uh, but, but there are four steps in the process of discipleship. The first is engaging. And that's just part like going. It's just being willing to say, okay, I'm going to go. I'm going to engage with someone. I'm going to rise up out of myself, out of my little shell. Even though I'm an introvert, I'm still going to go ahead and engage with someone. I'm going to start a relationship. I'm going to engage in conversation. Um, and, and we have a simple process for doing that. We call it SALT. Start a, start a conversation. Hey, nice day today. Hey, what'd you do for, for Moon Festival? Um, I've seen you around at work, you know. I've seen you in class. You know, I had a friend who used to just leave his watch off and uh, back in the days when we didn't have cell phones. And he'd just walk around the campus and say, hey, what time is it? You know, that's how we start conversations. What time is it? I don't have my watch, you know. And then, he, and then they start at the, oh, okay, you know, it's 1233. Uh, hey, you got a, a couple minutes? Yeah, you know, a couple more minutes till I start, my class starts. And then he just thought we'd start a conversation. And so just finding ways to make small talk. Start a conversation. Ask a person their name. Are you part of this class? Hey, you work, how long have you worked here? Or whatever it might be. Engage with people. Start asking questions and then uh, listen. So salt. Start a conversation, ask questions, listen. And then as, you, as people talk, like we talked about how every, storms will come into everyone's life. You can listen to, to their stories. And, and from the stories, just ask further questions until you start to, to, to get to know more about them. Because as you do that, then they're gonna, their lives will begin to open up to salt. Because invariably, people will hit times in their lives when they have, a, have difficulty. And that'll be a moment when you can then minister to them, pray for them. Simple thing, saying, hey, can I pray for you? Or just encourage them and saying, you know, God knows. God can help in your tough times. Okay, so that's engage. Establish just means to, to once a person comes to know Christ, decides to follow him, it's helping them with the essentials and saying, here's, here's what it means to, to build a relationship with Jesus and giving them the essentials of learning to hear God's voice. How do you build a strong relationship? We do this when, when couples are getting ready to get married. We, we take them through a pre-marriage -mar like a workshop and just says, now here's the difficulties that happen in every marriage. And here's some skills, some tools that, that build great relationships. And as you learn these, they're going to they're gonna help you build a strong marriage. You know, it's interesting. I was just doing a, a, just reading, doing a little study on what they call love marriages versus arranged marriages. And, and love marriages have such a worse success rate than arranged marriages. I think arranged marriages, the, 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 the percentage of divorces of, of arranged marriages is somewhere, somewhere less than 5%. Somewhere, depending on the, the, the country and the, the community, it's somewhere in the, in the realm of 3 to 4%. And some places, as low as 1%. Or if you take some places like the U.S., where we're all into Hollywood and love marriages, we love, you know, we have all, every kind of dating app in the world, you know, find someone, find the true love of your life. And we're about 50% success rate. And you think, well, how can that be? When two people who actually love each other get married, how is it that they're less successful in building a love relationship than people who were arranged together to be together? And it's interesting, is reading through, you know, the, how to have a good arranged marriage and how, how people in arranged marriages find love. 
And I said, well, number one, we start off with, we, we, we have, a, we have when the people who, who put us together find that we're from, find people of different backgrounds that they think we'll have a lot in common. And a lot of times those people are smarter than we are because something about infatuation kind of makes your brain shut down. You know? <laughs> when you get infatuated, you see a pretty girl out of magazine and you just think she's the most beautiful, nicest girl in the world. She must love Jesus. Never met her, but her picture's so beautiful. You know, she must really, you know, honor her parents and be good with her money. And you know, that's just that's the way our brains work, which is not a good way to build a relationship. And so they said, you know, we start out knowing that we have to build a relationship. And so we have these principles. You start off by being friends. You you spend time together. You build trust. And we start to we develop these habits of strong relationships that then over time we end up in real love the kind of love that lasts the kind of love that i'm with my best friend and i'm enjoying life with them and i feel satisfied with them and so the rate of satisfaction in arranged marriage is much higher than love marriages not on the wedding day but over time you see the the guys in the love marriages, yeah, you know, to death do us part, sickness and hell, oh, uh, just stars in their eyes. Yeah, I'm just so in love with you. Nothing until death do us part. Arranged marriage, I don't know you. <laughs> you know? We just met, but, you know, here we go. And okay, we'll, we'll build this thing. I'm committing. But as the years go by, it goes like this. And all of a sudden, it, within, within the three or four years, the, the arranged marriage, the love is so much deeper than the love marriage because it's, that's so shallow and they've never actually developed the habits of building a relationship. And so established means we're, we want to give you the tools to build a strong relationship with God and then equip. We want to equip you then to help others because it's never just about you. In Christianity, everybody gets to play. We're all disciples which means they're also all disciple makers. And then empower, because you and I, we're, we are created to make a difference in the world around us. And so we want to empower you then with your relationship with God and the things you've been equipped with to go and make a difference in the world around you. Okay, we can go to the next slide, I think. There we go. Discipline. So how does that happen? It happens through discipline. It's not just magic. We don't just have these ideas, but what it takes is discipline of walking out these the four E's and these different practices. You actually have to continue in them. You can understand all the right theory. And this is true of any business, of any sports endeavor. You can have all the right theories. You can have all the right game plans. But if you don't have the discipline to execute your business plan or execute your, your, your game plan, you're never going to be successful. It takes discipline. Paul said this, don't you realize that in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. Okay? So, so I run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. And so it takes discipline to win in this race called life, which is a marathon. And here's the, er the seven areas that you want to, the fundamental er areas where you need to develop discipline. One is faith, and that is your relationship with God. There are some disciplines that will help you in your relationship with God. And we talk about them just reading your Bible. Every day, just reading your Bible and saying, God, you speak to me through the scripture. And it's not a matter of the volume that you read. It's a matter of allowing, learning to allow God to speak to you through the scripture. So as you read the word, you come with an expectation of say, okay, God, what lesson do you have for me here? What do you want to say to me in the word? And then praying every day, just bring, opening up your life to God. This is part, like they, they talk about in arranged marriages, you have to learn to share, take time to share with each other. Talk about your childhood. Build trust through sharing about your day. Take, take time, set aside time to talk about your day, to talk about your past, to talk about your desires. And in that sharing, the bond, a bond is built that 
eventually becomes and goes from friendship to love. And same with God. As you spend time with him every day, just sharing your life with him. God, this is what I'm, I did today. This is kind of, kind of went for me. It was a great day or it was a bummer day. Or this is what I'm hoping for. This is what I'm disappointed about. As you begin to talk to God, a trust begins to be built and relationships built. So the fundamentals, your habits, the disciplines that you need to develop, it's the daily disciplines of reading the Bible and prayer. If you don't, it's a lot of times it's easier to be on a, a, a reading the Bible program. Some of us just pop our Bible open and say, okay, that's scripture today. But, but as a church, we do a, a reading program together because it's easy to help each other. We encourage you to just get, jump on that. Yeah, it's on the, on the website. Uh, family. Family is so important. Rhythms in your family. I'm saved because of my family, because it was my mom who discipled me. As I didn't know what discipleship was, I didn't realize that all along, it was my mom and, and dad who discipled us, because every day we'd have family devotions. And uh, during the day, when we mess up, our parents would say, you know, you know, this is what the scriptures say, and this is how you live life. And so that's where my discipleship began, and that's where it's meant to begin. God chose your family for you. So your mom and dad, your cousins, your brothers and sisters, you didn't choose them, God chose them. And they're there for a purpose. So you're saying, God, why am I in this family? What is their contribution to me? What is my contribution to them? I'm so thankful for my family. Uh, you know, every Sunday, I wouldn't go to church every Sunday, but my mom made sure I was at church every Sunday. She talked about discipline. You know, she, she made discipline out in our lives. Um, function. And that could be school, it could be work. It's the stuff that you do. It's how you function in society. What is your place? And you need to do that well. If you have a job, show up for work. Get there early. Do what's being asked of you. Treat your boss well. If you're in school, do your schoolwork. Show up for class. Unless the waves are really good. Then you go surfing. <laughs> that's, uh, that's what we did in Hawaii. But, you know, but... Live with excellence because that becomes a testimony to others. I remember when, when our family first, when we first came to Christ and my dad was the last one in our family to come to church. And we went to this church that was kind of in a bad area and it was like just a, a small church of like 30 or 40 people, but God was doing amazing thing, things there. And so we were excited about church and finally my dad said, I got to come and find out what this is because it's like a really bad part of town and um, it, they're like at church all the time. So I got, what is this? Is this a cult? Is it some weird new religion? So he came to church. And when he came to church, he saw a couple of guys he knew. My dad had an engineering company. And he said, oh, there's, you know, there's Dan Mita. And there's Richard Fuji. Guys that he worked with, who worked for the government or worked for other, other companies that he did engineering with. And he said, those guys, they're like solid guys. They're good engineers. These are guys that, I've, they're, they're like men of character, integrity. They work hard. They do good work. And then he saw this other wo woman, e e Elizabeth Brumley, and, and she and her husband, George, they had like the number one um, fo studio, uh, photo, photo, photography studio in town. And all of our, they had taken all of our baby pictures. And so she was just, everybody in town knew their, their photo studio. And, she, and she, so she's in the church, and she was excellent. And she's, everybody knows her. You know, she just has such a great reputation. And so when he saw all these people, immediately, even before church started, he just saw people that he trusted that had integrity in their function, excellence where they worked. And by their reputation, he was like, okay. Because otherwise, the church was a little crazy. We sang a lot, real loud, and we had long church services, like two and a half hours and three hours. And, and he probably would not have come back again, except he said, now these guys are normal. And they're, these guys are, they're excellent. They're good, good people. So your testimony matters. How you conduct yourself in work, at school. Friends. Friends are so important. Who do you surround yourself with? Who do you spend time with? Because your friends will begin to affect your character and your lifestyle. So build strong friendships with good people. Your finances. How do you handle your finances? Are you disciplined in your finances? Do you treat your friends well? Do you treat your finances well? Do you have some margins in your life? Do you, as, as, you know, are, are, you, are you a person who's generous in life? We talked last week about how you know, Christianity, like as a church, we function by the giving that people do. And historically in, in Christianity, 
um, from Judaism into the early years and, and, and throughout Christian history, people always would give 10%. A tithe was the normal giving. And, and actually, finance, finance matter, managers always say, you know, 10%, putting 10% away for the future and giving 10% to charity is just a healthy way to live your life. Learning to live off of the 70 or 80% is just a healthy way to live your life. To develop for the future and to develop, be, be a contributing member of society. And so as I, I, I tell you, as a church, we, we've been blessed. We had, we've had, in our, in our early years, we had people who gave way above 10%. And we had some folks who were financially blessed and they kind of footed the bill for this church. Um, and uh, we, we had three in particular who just, they just gave and gave and gave. And over the past year, they've all moved away from Taiwan. And so as a church, uh, just being honest with you, we, we actually, our income has dropped by over half this year, which is exciting for me as a leader. I'm like, yay, God, here we go, you know, because in the end, God is our supplier. And if he wants us here, he will provide. But I also want to encourage you as a church as a part of this church family, to say, you know, to be, go to God and say, God, okay, what's my role in this? With the finances you've given me, what do I do? Because as believers, we believe that everything we have comes from the Lord. And so we say, God, how do you want me to spend the finances you've given me? Fitness. You're responsible for your body. The health that it's in. And uh, like me, I think about working out. But at some point, you actually got to work out. Take care of your body. What goes into it and how you work it out. And I want to encourage you. You know, God's given you one body. And you need to take care of that body. Because it's the workshop through which you do his work. And if you don't take care of it, um, then that, that season of work that you can do for him will just be shorter. You know? So fitness and then fun. You know, God wants us to be happy people. And there's just a health. Every part of our life is, is affected by enjoyment. Jesus said this. Then Jesus said to the disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? when Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, it's because that's what he did for us. He gave his life for us. He laid down his life for us. And we in turn, as we begin to understand how much he loved us, we in turn then love him. And actually, that's, the, that's what ties discipline to discipleship. We can just have dead discipline. And we can do all the things right. We can study the scriptures. We can show up for church every Sunday. We can pray every day. But if there's no following of Jesus, if there's no actual relationship with Jesus, then what we actually have is just dead religion, the same as any other dead religion, without the relationship with Jesus. And what makes discipleship different from discipline, what gives life to the discipline, is that relationship with Jesus, that it's following him. Our prayer for you today is, as we close uh, is that your heart would be renewed. That you would experience what Jesus promised, a new heart that's soft towards him. That you would begin to, to, to understand the love of God. But more than that, that you would begin, that you would come to a place of experiencing the love of God. Because one experience with, with the love of God, one encounter with him will radically transform your life just like it did uh, to the Saint, Saint Paul. So many saints of old. So many saints in this room. And our prayer is that even if you've known Christ, that there would be a renewal this week, a fresh encounter with Him, to fall more deeply in love with Him. And that as a people, you would hear His voice and know His heart. So may Lord, the Lord bless you with a living relationship with our living Savior. Amen.